After we have introduced the condition expectation, let us now discuss its properties. And let us start with the following one. So I give myself two uh, integrable random variables called x and y. And as usual, I consider sub sigma algebra of f denoted by g. And then it holds true uh, that if I consider a linear combination of the random variables x and y and compute its conditional expectation, then this is the same as considering the linear combination of the conditional expectations of x and the conditional expectation of y p almost truly. This means nothing else but the conditional expectation is linear. Moreover, if uh, it holds true that uh, x is less than or equal to y p almost truly, then the same holds true for its conditional expectation, meaning the conditional expectation of x given g is less than or equal to um, the conditional expectation of y given g p almost truly. So this means that the conditional expectation is monotone. And finally, uh, if, if the triangular inequality holds true, meaning if you compute the absolute value of the conditional expectation of f given g, then this, this is the same as the conditional expectation of the modulus of f given g p almost true me. And I leave that, uh, the proof of that uh, theorem for you as an exercise. And you see, you should be a little bit surprised. R recall that this conditional expectation, so what we have written here, is just a symbol for the um, g measurable random variable which appears in the definition of the conditional expectation. But nonetheless, um, this random variable has the same properties as if you would compute a kind of expectation. And that's why I introduced that kind of symbol. Let us focus on another uh, property, namely, uh, let me, f uh, that's a statement of the theorem 112. Um, and for that, again, I consider an integrable random variable called x and a sub sigma algebra g uh, of our sigma algebra f from our probability space. And suppose that x is g measurable and we have another random variable y which is integrable such that the product between x and y is also integrable, then it holds true that the conditional expectation of the product of x and y given g is the same as x times the conditional expectation of y given g p almost shown. And this property is called uh, measurable factors, meaning, and this you should be a little bit surprised, um, you see that a random variable with a g measurable acts as if it would be a constant with respect to the usual expectation. So constant you take, can take out from the expectation. And the same holds true if you have a g measurable function. So this is, uh, with respect to that conditional expectation, this is like a constant. But that's not, not you, you should not think of that really as a constant, but it's more random variable, but it does not depend on that expectation. The second property called tower property is the following. You consider now a further sub sigma algebra, which I denoted by H. So, and this should be a sub sigma algebra of G, meaning you have the following inclusion. The sub sigma algebra um, H is contained in the sub sigma algebra G, and which is contained then in the, sub, uh, in the sigma algebra F of our probability space. And then the following two inequalities holds true here almost surely, namely, if I compute the conditional expectation given G, of the conditional expectation of x given h, then this thing is the same as the conditional expectation of x given h. And the same also holds true if you interchange now the rules of the um, sigma algebra g and h, meaning if you compute the conditional expectation of given h, the so smaller sigma algebra of the random variable, uh, namely this conditional expectation of x given uh, g, this is the same as the conditional expectation of x given h. 
And finally, uh, if the sigma algebra generated by x is independent of this uh, sigma algebra g, then it holds true that the condition expectation of x given g is simply um, the expectation of x. So let us have a look at uh, this proof and you will see what is the strategy of uh, how, how one should prove such kind of theorems. So let us address the first one, this measurable factors. Uh, so in this proof I divide in two steps. And in the first step I would like to assume that the random variables x and y appearing in the um, uh, theorem are non-negative. And then I would like to show uh, that the condition expectation of the product of x and y given g is equal uh, to the product between the random variable x and this condition expectation of y given g being on this journey. So what should be the strategy? Our strategy at the end of the day is we would like to um, apply the uniqueness part of the conditional expectation. And for that we have to check two things. So first of all, but since the product of x and y is in L1, we can apply, um, so we can compute the conditional expectation of that product. And in particular, this means that that object over here is a g-measurable function. The same holds true for the product between x and the conditional expectation of y. By definition, that object is a g-measurable function. By assumption, x is a g-measurable function, and the product is again g-measurable. So let us have, so this is the first observation we have. So the second observation is, uh, we would like to uh, compute the second uh, property of the conditional expectation, meaning we would like to compute the expectation of the indicator function of a measurable set A of a random variable. And in order to do so, let us first approximate our random variable x in the following way. So I blow it up by factor 2 to the n, I multiply uh, it with x. So I take the uh, lower integer part and then I rescale it back. Meaning uh, nothing else but um, the random variable x only takes discrete values, namely the value at k times 2 to the minus n. And so that's a different representation of that shorthand notation. And that holds true for any n in the integers uh, uh, I give myself. So and here's a couple of, uh, of observations. So first of all, we know that xn is monotone and converges monotonically uh, towards x. And since y is non-negative, the same holds true for the product of xn and y. This converges in a monotone way towards the product of x and y. And since um, y is non-negative by assumption, we also know that the condition expectation of y given g is uh, non-negative by the monotonicity of the condition expectation. Hence, also the product of xn times the condition expectation of y converges in a monotone way towards x times the condition expectation of y. And we would like to use that later on. So for now, let us fix a measurable set A taken from the sigma algebra G. Let us first have a look at the following expectation. Namely, I compute the expectation of the indicator function of this set A of the random variable xn times the conditional expectation of y given G. So now let me rewrite that xn in that form. And I would like to use um, uh, um, the, uh, it's not far true, it's uh, the theorem of Bevolevi, which allows us to um, take out this uh, infinite sum from the expectation. So and then I can also take out that um, constant, namely k times uh, 2 to the minus n. And what is left here is the expectation of the indicator function 
of A intersecting with the set um, Xn uh, equal to K times 2 to the minus N. And you see, um, the function X, so the random variable X is G measurable, meaning also that the random variable Xn is G measurable. And this Im immediately implies that that set over here is contained in the sigma algebra G, meaning also that this intersection is contained in the um, sigma algebra G. So hence we can apply the second property of the condition expectation, which allows us to rewrite that expectation over here as the expectation of the indicator function of that complicated set of the random variable y. Now again, I use the theorem of Bepo-Levy, which allows uh, us to um, bring that uh, infinite um, sum into the con uh, into this expectation, and then I can again use the definition of x n and can rewrite that in the following form, namely as the expectation of the indicator function of a of x n times y. And now remember that x n times y and n, n times the condition expectation of y are monotone, meaning I can now use the monotone convergence theorem, which tells us that that left-hand side over here uh, converges to the uh, expectation of the indicator function of a of the random variable x times the condition expectation of y given g. On, other, on the other hand, by the monotone convergence theorem, we also know that that expectation over here converges towards the expectation of the indicator function of A of the product of X and Y. So what have we gained by that? We have gained the following, that the expectation uh, of the indicator function of A of this product X times the, in, uh, the condition expectation of Y given G is equal uh, to the um, uh, expectation of the indicator function of A of the product X and Y. Now you can you also use the definition of condition expectation, meaning that this is the same as the expectation of the indicator function of A of the condition expectation of the product of X and Y given G. But now by the uniqueness of the condition expectation since that equality holds true for any a and g and we know that that object over here is g measurable and that, that object over here is g measurable we know that these two things has to be equal p almost truly and that's exa exactly what we have claimed here and you see the final step to relax that condition that x and y are non-negative you do by uh, the usual approximation, namely you write x and uh, you decompose x into its positive and negative part and the same for y, you decompose y into its positive and negative part and then you apply step one to each of these um, different factors and use linearity of uh, condition expectation and uh, the assertion follows. Let us come now to the part of the second, uh, the proof of the second part, namely this tower property. And I, as the first step, I would like to show to you that this first factor, so that's condition expectation, of, condition expectation of x given h given g equals to the condition expectation of x given h p almost sure. But you see that part is a direct consequence of this um, measurable factors we just have proven. Why? Well, uh, let's go back. Here you can see it better. Think of that object over here playing the role of x in that part A. And uh, multi uh, think of, uh, of the constant 1, you can multiply that thing by 1, as a role of y. For sure, we know that the condition expectation of x given h um, is um, g measurable, and we also know by the triangular inequality that this condition expectation is an L1, 
And also we know that the constant function 1 is in L1 and the product is then again in L1 as well. So now you see by this theorem over here, it means we can take out from the conditional expectation this measurable factor. So and what is left then is simply the conditional expectation of, uh, of the constant function 1. So I have summarized that for you here. So we have exactly, we start with that conditional expectation. We can rewrite that as this product. Then as I explained, um, just uh, it's, I can take out that measurable factor. We are left with the conditional expectation of one given g, but this thing is simply one. So we obtain um, the conditional expectation of x given h as a result. And this holds true p almost surely, and so we have seen that the first bit we also have proven. Now it remains to prove that x equality over here. Now we have to argue differently, because here we take the conditional expectation of the random variable x given g, and we condition it on the smallest sigma algebra. And here the proof goes as follows. So let me fix um, a measurable set taken from the sigma algebra H. So and then I would like to compute uh, the following, namely uh, the expectation of the indicator function of A of this conditional expectation of um, um, this conditional expectation of X given G given H. So since A is in H, we can use the second property of the definition of condition expectation, which allows us to rewrite that expectation as the expectation of the indicator function of A of the condition expectation of X given G, meaning exactly of that random variable appearing here. But now, since a is chosen from the sigma algebra H and the sigma algebra H is contained in the sigma algebra G. It also was true that this uh, measurable set A is an element from the sigma algebra of G. So we can again apply the second uh, property of the definition of the condition expectation, which allows us to rewrite that expectation over here as the expectation of the indicator function of set A uh, times the um, uh, random variable x. And now simply I use again uh, the definition of the condition expectation, namely the second property, to rewrite that expectation over here as the expectation of this indicator function of A of the condition expectation of x given h. So that was the first bit. The second uh, observation is this object over here is H measurable by definition. And also we know that that ob object over here is H me measurable. Why? By using the triangle inequality, I know that the condition expectation of X given G is in L1. So I can compute also of that object the conditional expectation and then it follows from the definition of the conditional expectation that that object is H measurable. So now again we can use the uniqueness part uh, of the proof of the existence of the conditional expectation which allows us to conclude well here we have two different versions of the condition expectation, meaning these two versions has to be the same p almost surely. And this is exactly what we claimed to prove. Well, let us come now to the third part of the theorem. And here we would like to prove that under the assumption that the sigma algebra generated by x is independent of the sigma algebra g, that the condition expectation of x given g equals the expectation of x p almost surely. And you see the strategy is again the same. We would like to use the uniqueness part of the condition expectation. So in here we have to do first a couple of observations. So the constant uh, map 
which maps omega to the expectation of x, is measurable with respect to this trivial sigma algebra, meaning with respect to the sigma algebra which only consists of the empty set and the full space. But this is for sure a sub-sigma algebra of the sigma algebra G. Hence, uh, that map over here is G measurable. And moreover, it's trivially in uh, L1. So by assumption, we also know that for any um, set A taken from the sigma algebra G, that's the indicator function of this set A, is an independent random variable with respect to this random variable x. So now we would like to use that. And let us compute first the expectation of the indicator function of A of the conditional expectation of x given G. So by definition of the conditional expectation, this is nothing else but the expectation of the indicator function of A times x. But now we know that these two random variables are independent. So I can rewrite that expectation as a product of two expectations, namely the expectation of the indicator function of A times uh, the expectation of x. So that's a constant over here. So this constant I can also take inside this uh, expectation here. So I can write that as the expectation of the indicator function of A of the expectation of X. And now you see by that object observation over here, uh, we have now two different representations of the conditional expectation of X given G. And by the uniqueness part, that means that these two um, uh, versions of the condition expectation has to be the same, meaning the condition expectation of x given g in this particular case equals the expectation of x p almost truly. So this was uh, was one important properties, uh, so this fundamental properties too of the condition expectation. Now let us focus on how does a conditional expectation behaves under taking limits. So I would like to prove a version of Lebesgue's uh, dominated convergence theorem for conditional expectations. And that's the statement of the following theorem. Again, for that I uh, consider a sub-sigma algebra of our sigma algebra f denoted by g and I would like to consider an integrable and non-negative random variable y. And then I consider a sequence xn of random variables having the following properties. First of all, I can bound the modulus of xn by this random variable y p almost truly for any n in the natural numbers. And I also assume that the sequence xn converges towards x p almost truly. And then it holds true that the limit of the conditional expectations of xn given g converges towards the conditional expectation of x given g. And this convergence holds true in uh, p almost truly and in L1. So let us first address the convergence in L1. So we have to prove that the limit as n tends to infinity of the expectation of the modulus of the difference between the expectation of xn given g and the expectation of x given g um, is zero or converges to zero. So how to do that? So, in the first step, we simply use um, linearity to rewrite that object over here. Namely, by linearity, I also can write that expectation here as the expectation of the modulus of the conditional expectation of the difference between xn and x. And now I can use the triangle inequality, which allows me to take that modulus inside the conditional expectation. So in that way, I obtain an upper bound. So I have 
as a result, the expectation of the condition and expectation of the modulus of xn minus x given g. And now I use the second property of the definition of condition expectations. Why am I allowed to do that? Well, I know that that object over here, so that modulus of xn minus x, is bounded from above by 2 times y. That random variable is integrable, so this means also that difference over here is integrable. So I'm allowed to um, uh, construct the condition expectation of that random variable. And now you can think here as an indicator function of omega. Omega for sure is a um, g measurable set. And then in thinking of that object over here in that form, you see I can apply the second part of the definition of condition expectations, so which allows me to rewrite that object here simply as the expectation of the modulus of xn minus x. So, but now we know that xn minus x converges to zero here most surely, and as I told you, that difference is bounded by two times y for any n and n. Hence, uh, we obtain the following, namely by taking the limb sub as n tends to infinity of the difference we are interested in. We, for sure, we know that this difference is non-negative. And on the other hand, that's bounded from above by the limb sub of the expectation of xn minus, of the modulus of xn minus x. And now we can use Lebesgue's dominated conversion theorem for usual expectations to conclude that that um, um, expectation over here converges to zero. And in that way we have proven uh, the convergence in L1. Now let us address the almost sure convergence. And for that I would like to um, define uh, the following uh, random variable Zn defined as a supremum of all k, which are larger or equal to n, of the difference between the xn and x, and the modulus of that. So what do we know? By assumption, since we know that xn converges to x p almost surely, we know that zn converges to 0 p almost surely, and moreover we know that Zn is bounded from above by 2 times y and from below trivially by 0. This holds true for any n in, um, in the natural numbers. So now we also know uh, by construction that the sequence of uh, Zn is monotone decreasing. Why? Let's have a look. So you see, if you make n larger, then the set over which you take the supremum shrinks, and that's why you know that um, Zn is larger or equal than Zn plus 1. So now we can, uh, so since we have that monotonicity p almost surely, we also can conclude by the um, monotonicity property of the condition expectation that also the condition expectation of Zn given g is larger or equal to the condition of expectation of Zn plus 1 given g, p almost surely. So since we have now a decreasing sequence of random variables which is bounded from below, we know uh, that this sequence has to converge. So we know that there is a random variable called z, which is simply the limit of these conditional expectations of the n given g. And we know uh, by, this, uh, by, the, by the property that z n is bounded from below by z, that this random variable is non-negative. Now I can use Fatou's lemma to compute its expectation. So we know the expectation of z is non-negative by that estimate over here. I can apply Fatou's lemma which tells us that if I take out the limb inf, I make that whole thing larger. So meaning the limb inf of, uh, I have an upper bound, namely the limb inf of the expectation of the conditional expectation of Zn given G. But now I can again use 
the second part of the definition of conditional expectations. Namely, imagine that here in front there is the indicator function of omega. So then you see that's exactly of the form of the second part of the definition of the conditional expectation, meaning that I can rewrite that expectation of the conditional expectation as simply the expectation of the n. But since we know that Zn converges to zero p almost surely, and Zn, the sequence Zn is bounded from above uh, by two times y, and this is an integrable random variable, I can use the dominated convergence theorem and take the uh, lim inf, so I know that this thing converges, so not, I can replace here the lim inf also by the uh, leanness as n tends to infinity, and I conclude that that thing converges to zero. Meaning, our random variable zn is zero, p almost surely. So, which is an, tells us uh, simply that the leanness as n tends to infinity of this conditional expectation of zn given g converges to zero, p almost surely. So what have we gained now? Well, let us now consider the modulus of the difference between uh, the conditional expectation of xn given g and the conditional expectation of x given g. So we would like to prove that that object over here converges p almost truly to that object. So by using linearity um, and uh, um, trying that inequality, I can bound that difference here by the ex conditional expectation of the n given g. But for that, we have seen this object converges to zero pair almost surely. Hence, we can conclude that the uh, conditional expectation of xn given g converges p almost surely to the conditional expectation of x given g. Almost joy. So, and you see that, con uh, that finished the proof of that part. And as a remark, uh, you can also show that not only the Lebesgue dominated convergence theorem holds true for condition expectations, but also a version of the monotone convergence theorem holds true, and uh, a version of Fatou's lemma holds true. Let us now focus on another important um, um, inequality which we will use later on a couple of times, namely a version of Jensen's inequality for condition expectations. That's a following statement. I consider again an integrable random variable x and a sub sigma algebra of f denoted by g. And moreover, I consider a convex function phi from r to r, uh, which should have the property that phi of x is in L1 um, of p, meaning that that function over here is again an integrable function. And then it holds true that phi of the conditional expectation of x given g is bounded from above by the conditional expectation of phi of x, given g, p almost joint. Before coming to the proof, let me add a couple of remarks. You can generalize that theorem in various ways. First, first of all, um, in situation where this function phi is only defined uh, from some open subset of r um, uh, to r, uh, there is also a version of uh, this Jensen inequality, but you have to ensure then that um, this random variable x takes only values in this open subset. Moreover, you can also relax that condition over here, but for that you have to rely on the more general form of the conditional uh, expectation, meaning that uh, we have discussed that in the, uh, after the definition of condition expectation, that this assumption that the random variable x appearing, for which you would like to compute the condition expectation, need not to be integrable, but either its positive part or its negative part has to be um, uh, integrable. That's, uh, that would be enough. 
So in that respect, you can also um, relax uh, that condition. But let's stick to that version over here. So the proof uh, goes again into two steps. And the first step is a trivial step. Namely, let us consider first of all the case when phi is an affine linear function, meaning that you can write phi of x as simply this um, function a x plus b, so a linear function, where a and b are just some real values. And then you see this theorem over here, first of all the equality holds, and second, it's a trivial consequence of the linearity of the condition expectation. Why? Well, let's compute what is phi of the condition expectation of x given g. Under that assumption, it's nothing else but a times the condition expectation of x given g plus b. Now you see by linearity, you can bring the a and the b inside the condition expectation. So you simply obtain the condition expectation of this uh, linear combination a x plus b given g. But that's nothing else but phi of x given g. P almost sure. So having, having understood that case, let us now address a more general case, namely that phi is a convex function which is not affine linear. We would like to exclude that. And you will see in a, uh, in a moment why we should exclude that. So then the following holds true. Any convex function you can write as a supremum over affine linear function where uh, the coefficients a and b, so the slope and this um, uh, offset, is chosen in such a way, so chosen from the set S5, where S5 is simply defined as the set of all points a, b in R2 such that this linear function a y plus b is less than or equal to our uh, convex function uh, phi of y for all y and r. So here's a picture of that. You, so you see, first of all, that that set over here is non-empty because you'd simply take um, this, um, this tangential um, uh, linear function at any point x of our um, uh, of our convex function, and this shows you that this set over here is non-empty because uh, that linear function will always be below our uh, convex function. But you see that set could also uh, consist of, of really an interval, and so it need not to be single valued, but uh, could also be a, a huge amount of functions uh, sitting inside here. Um, Namely, if you have here this kind of kick, then you see you have different slopes which you can uh, have here, so different linear functions with different slope. And it's true that you always, if you make I, a, a b smaller, so then you have shift your this curve down, and these functions are always in that set. So you see there you have a huge variety of. Um, um, parameters a and p you can optimize over. So now comes the following observation, uh, namely the map which maps a and b, this pair a b, to this linear function a x plus b is continuous for every x in r. So that's trivial. And now here's the point where we have to exclude that phi is um, affine linear, namely for any pair of um, uh, a b taken from that set a phi, there exists sequence a n b n um, taken from the set um, s phi intersecting with um, the rational numbers uh, squared such that uh, a n converges to a and b n converges to b. So why you have to exclude that affine linear function? Imagine you have an affine linear function, the slope is given by an irrational number. So then you have no chance to approximate that irrational number by a sequence of rational numbers because then 
you once you choose a different rational number for the slope, you does not satisfy any more that condition over here that that linear function is below your given um, convex function, which is our linear function with uh, irrational slope. So that's why we have to treat first the case of affine linear function separately. So once we have um, considered that observation over here, let us enumerate the elements from that set. That's a countable set. So we can find an enumeration and I would like to uh, denote that by the sequence a k b k. So what is then the consequence? Well, I would like to simply use the monotonicity and uh, the linearity of the conditional expectation, namely fix first of all a k from and in a k and b k from that uh, set over here. So then we know that the conditional expectation of phi of x given g is bounded from above by the conditional expectation of this linear function a k x plus b k given g. So this is here we use the monotonicity of the conditional expectation. Now we can use the linearity of the conditional expectation and it, we can write that as a k times the conditional expectation of x given g plus b k. And so you see that holds true p almost truly, meaning there exists a p null set, which I would like to call uh, nk, that 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 estimate over here holds true for all omegas in omega um, uh, without this set nk. And now you see why we have chosen a countable, um, this countable set uh, here because I would like to now define the set n simply as this union of all the set nk. And since the set was countable, we have here a countable union of null sets. And since the countable union of p null sets is still a p null set, we can also have that. So we have one null set such that this um, estimate holds true for all k. So now it's important, our null set does not depend anymore on k. Hence, we can take also, since this estimate holds true for all k, we can also take the supremum over all k. So we have the following estimate, namely that the condition expectation of phi of x given g is bounded from below by the supremum of this linear combination of a k condition expectation of x given g plus b k for all k in our uh, in the natural numbers. And since we know that that thing here equals to phi of um, the conditional expectation of x given g for all omegas uh, which are in the complement of our null sets n, we have proven um, the statement. So let us now come to a kind of corollary uh, which shows to you that the conditional expectation has also something to do with projections. And for that, I consider now a random variable x, which is square integrable. So meaning x is chosen uh, in the space L2 of p. Moreover, again, I choose the sub sigma algebra of f, which I denote by g. Then it holds true since the expectation of the difference of x and y squared is larger or equal to the expectation of x minus the conditional expectation of x given g squared for all um, um, square integrable random variables y which are g measurable. Meaning that the best, uh, so the, the smallest error in approximating x by a g measurable function is given simply by this conditional expectation. This is what is encoded here. So then you see, this is a kind of statement you can say, if you want to project down as this random variable x onto the space of g measurable functions, 
then you simply get uh, as, a, as, a, as a true norm of the difference that value over here. So how does the proof go? Well, against this inequality, we first of all know that the expectation of the conditional expectation squared is finite. Why? You see, by the Jensen's inequality, you can take the square inside. And then again, you use the second property of the definition of conditional expectation. So imagine here again, you have this indicator function of omega standing in front of that conditional expectation. And then you see it's exactly the second property of the conditional expectation, which allows you to rewrite that expectation over here simply as the expectation of x squared. Moreover, for any g measurable and square integrable random variable y, you can use the Cauchy Schwarz inequality to show that the expectation of the product of x times y and the modulus of that is bounded from above um, by simply the square root of the product of the expectation of x squared times the expectation of y squared and by assumption we know both of these terms are finite hence we know that that thing is finite so this means we can compute the conditional expectation of the product of x and y so and by using the second property of the conditional expectation you can rewrite that thing simply as the expectation of the conditional expectation of as a product of x times y given g. But now we know by assumption that g, uh, y is g measurable. So we can use the theorem of uh, measurable factors, which allows us to take that y out of that conditional expectation. So in that way, we obtain the expectation of the product of y times the conditional expectation of x given g. The same argument allows us to conclude the following, namely if we compute the expectation of x times the conditional expectation of x given g, we can rewrite that using the second property of the conditional expectation. Again, imagine here is an indicator function of, um, of omega standing in front of that product as the expectation of the conditional expectation given g of the product between x and the conditional expectation of x given g. And again, by the same reasoning as above, that random variable over here is g measurable by definition. And using the theorem of measurable factors, I can take that out from the conditional expectation. So and what is left then is simply the, expect the conditional expectation of x given g, meaning we have here the expectation of the condition expectation of x given g squared. And these two observations we will use now. So simply let us consider the difference of the expectation of uh, x minus y squared and the expectation of x minus the condition expectation of x given g squared. Now let's use simply uh, binomials formula, meaning we multiply out that and that bracket. In that way we obtain y squared, then we get twice minus twice x times y, that's over here, and then we get also uh, um, the expectation x squared. But you see this uh, expectation of x squared cancels with the expectation of x squared you get from that term. So the remaining term is simply minus uh, 2 times x times the conditional expectation of x given g. So in, since we have here minus sign and here minus sign, we get here plus sign. And the last bit, which is uh, remaining, is the expectation of the conditional expectation of x given g squared. And since we have here minus sign in front, we get that with a minus sign. So now I would like to rewrite that term over here by what we observed here. And I would like to also rewrite that term over here by what we observed here. So in doing so, we get here simply 
um, 2 times y times the condition expectation of x given g and we obtain at that stage simply the expectation of the ex condition expectation of x given g squared. But now you see one of these terms, which you get here with twice and positive sign, cancels one of these terms. So what is left is simply the expectation of x uh, given g squared. And I use linearity of the expectation to bring all the three terms inside here. And now you see we are, that's a wonderful form because we can use the binomial formula again which allows us to rewrite that um, sum, um, or this linear combination, as simply uh, the expectation of y minus the condition expectation of x given g squared. So you see, that term over here is, so that term in, bracket, uh, in the expectation is non-negative, it's a square. So we have immediately the following upper bound, namely if this term is a uh, lower bound, this term here is bounded from below by zero, which means exactly what we wanted to prove, namely that that expectation over here is larger or equal than the conditional expectation of x minus the conditional expectation of x given g squared. Moreover, equality holds uh, if that term over here is zero. But the expectation of that term over here is zero since that term in the expectation is a non-negative random variable. It's only zero if that non-negative random, uh, non random variable is zero. So and that non-negative uh, non random variable is zero exactly if y is equal to the conditional expectation of x given g p almost surely. So in that way, we also have seen when equality holds, namely when y is given by that condition expectation. Okay, so before coming to a close, uh, let me show to you one further theorem, which will be important later on when we consider fair prices in arbitrage free markets. And that's the following theorem. I consider two random variables x and y on our measurable space omega f. And these random variables, the random variable x, one should take values in, our, in this measurable space e1 with the sigma algebra calligraphic e1. And the random variable x2 should take um, values in that measurable space e2 equipped with this random uh, with the sigma algebra calligraphic e2. Moreover, I assume that uh, we have uh, that g is a sub sigma algebra as of f as usual. And now I suppose that the sigma algebra generated by x1 is independent of g, whereas the random variable x2 is g measurable. Moreover, I consider a function h which maps this product space e1 cross e2 uh, to r, oh, here's r missing. And this should be an um, e1 tensor e2 comma uh, br, so this plural set, measurable function. And I would like to assume, in addition, that h of x1 comma x2, that that random variable is, in, is integral. And then it holds true that the condition expectation of that random variable is the same as uh, the expectation uh, of this function h of the random variable x1, comma, and in the second uh, component, you plug in a constant, you compute the expectation, and that constant is actually given by the value of the random variable x2, and that holds true p almost true. So, and I hope you will like that proof because it uses everything you learned about measure theory. So you see, the proof will go as, uh, as, as usual. You will, would prove that statement by um, um, 
by um, this procedure uh, of uh, measure theoretic induction. So meaning that you have to first prove that in the case when h is an indicator function, then when h is a simple function, a non-negative simple function, then when h is a non-negative uh, random variable, and then for general h. So that's why I divided the proof into various steps. So let us start with the first step. Namely, we assume that this uh, function h here is simply given as the indicator function of the Cartesian product between two measurable sets a1 and a2, where a1 is chosen from the sigma algebra e1 and a2 is chosen from the sigma algebra e2. So, and then let us compute what comes out. So, then the condition expectation of h of this random variable x1 and x2 given g is nothing else but the expectation, so the condition expectation of the indicator function that x1 is in a1 and the indicator function x2 is in a2 given g. But now we know that uh, by assumption uh, the random variable x2 is g measurable. This means that also the indicator function that x2 is contained in this um, measurable set a2 is a g-measurable function. So we can use the theorem of measurable factors to take that random variable over here out of the condition expectation. So that's the first step. So what I'm left here is the uh, with the conditional expectation of the indicator function that x1 is an a1 given g. But by assumption, the sigma algebra generated by x1 is independent of, um, of g. So this means simply that that conditional expectation uh, boils down to simply computing the expectation of the indicator function that x1 is an a1. So now what I would like to do is I would like to bring that indicator function again inside this expectation. But you see, I, in order to do so, so this thing over here is still random, namely it depends on that random variable. And in order to find a notation for that, let us fix the value x2 uh, takes. So for given omega, I know this value. And let's say that's this value y. And then I can bring, then it's a constant, I can bring that constant inside the expectation it obtains the following expression, namely uh, the expectation of the indicator function that x1 is in a1 times the indicator function that y is in a2 given that the value of y equals to that um, value of the random variable x2 of omega. So that's, you see, that's a kind of way to denote this remaining randomness. And you see, that's nothing else now by definition as the expectation of our function h uh, of x1, y, where y1 equals to x2. And that holds true, p almost true. So this was, so to say, the first step. But we want to have that statement for the measure theoretic induction, not for sets which are in that particular product form, but we would like to have it for general sets chosen from that product sigma algebra. How to do that? And now I like that part. I hope you will like it too. It goes as follows. I define the following system of subsets denoted by D. And these are the, any uh, measurable set taken from the product sigma algebra such that the following inequality uh, equality holds true, namely that the expectation of the indicator function of that set B of um, x1 and x2 given G equals to the expectation of the indicator function of B of x1 comma y given that y is equal to x2 p almost shown. And for sure that uh, system of subsets is, is, uh, is contained in this um, product sigma algebra E1 cross E2. So what should we do now? Well, 
we should prove that this system of subsets is a Dynkin system. So what does it mean? We have to prove that the whole space is contained in it, that if a set is contained, then also its complement is contained, and that the countable union of disjoint sets chosen from that uh, um, set of subsets D is contained in that subset D. So let's do that stepwise. So the first step is trivial. Namely, we have to prove that this uh, the full space, meaning E1 cross E2, is contained in D. But that's trivial. This follows immediately from step one, because that's um, a Cartesian product of uh, two measurable sets chosen from this sigma algebra E1 and E2. So let's come to the second property. We choose a set B from our um, a set of subsets script D. And we consider now the, indicate, uh, the condition expectation of the indicator function of B complement of x1 and x2 given G. So you see that indicator function I can rewrite as 1 minus the indicator function of the set B. And then I simply use linearity. So that's why P almost surely I have the following expression, namely 1 minus the condition and uh, expectation of the indicator function of B of this random variable x1 and x2 given g. But by assumption, the set B is chosen from the set calligraphic D, meaning we know that that condition expectation over here is the same as the expectation of the indicator function of B of x1, y, where y is chosen to be equal to x2 of omega. And now you see, I simply use again linearity of the expectation to bring that minus 1 inside this expectation. And then I can undo that step which I did here and rewrite the whole expression as the indicator function of B complement of x1, y, where y is equal to x2 uh, of omega. And this whole um, um, equality holds true P almost true. So in that way, we have proven, proven that also B complement is contained in the script, uh, in the set calligraphic D. Let us check the third property of a Dynkin system. For that, I choose a um, sequence of sets B1, B2, and so on in D, which are mutually disjoint. And I would like to denote the countable union of the sets Bi as a set so then let us compute simply the expectation of the indicator function of b of x1, x, x2 given g. So this I can write using the fact that these bi's are disjoint as the sum i from 1 to infinity of the indicator function of bi. Why can I do that? Well, if that pair x1 and x2 is in B, so this means there exists one i such this pair x1 and x2 is in that set bi. So meaning from that infinite sum over here, only one term is one and all the other terms are zero. That's why this equality holds true. So now I can rewrite that uh, sum over here, the so sum one to uh, i from one to infinity as the limit as n tends to infinity of the partial sum going from 1 to n. And since this partial sum is for any n is bounded from above by 1 and 1 is integrable, I can now use the dominated convergence theorem for condition expectations which allows me to take out uh, the limit as n tends to infinity. And then I can, as the second step, I can use simply linearity to bring that finite sum outside the condition expectation. So these steps hold true, P almost truly, so I obtain the following, namely that I have that infinite sum outside these conditional expectations. But now I can use um, the definition of uh, the set D. We know by assumption that the sets Bi are in that set D, meaning I can rewrite that conditional expectation simply as the expectation of the indicator function of Bi 
uh, the initial function of pi for x1, y, where y is equal to x2. Pi almost true. And you see, since we have a countable union, we have not to worry about this null sets because the countable union of null sets is again a null set, so we can find one null set such that um, that holds true uh, for every i. So in, in that way, I can now take again this uh, by Beboli, this infinite sum inside the expectation. And then I can uh, re rewrite that back into the indicator function of the set B. And in that way, I have proven for a general set B uh, that uh, the expectation of the indicator function of B of x1, x2 given G equals to the expectation of the indicator function of B of x1, y, where y is equal to x2, the almost true. Meaning that also a countable union of um, disjoint uh, sets taken from D is contained in D. Hence, this, this set of uh, um, this system of subsets is simply a Dynkin system. So now we would like to prove that this uh, Dynkin system equals to the product sigma algebra. How to do that? Well, by the first step, we know that all uh, product sets A1, A2 are contained in D. But this immediately implies also that the Dynkin system generated by this uh, by this kind of sets um, is contained in D. And we also know that this set Caligari D is contained in the product sigma algebra by construction. Moreover, we know that this set, which I denote here by calligraphic C, is stable under finite intersections. Hence, we can apply the pi lambda theorem or the fundamental theorem of Dynkin system, which tells us that this Dynkin system generated by this set of subsets C equals the sigma algebras generated by this system of subsets C. But this system of subsets C generated, uh, so the sigma algebra generated by the system of subsets C equals to the product sigma algebra. So in that way, we have proven that D equals to the product sigma algebra. And this was the first step in our measurable uh, measure theoretic induction we have obtained here. Well, the next step is to consider that H is a non-negative simple function, meaning that I can write H as a finite linear combination of um, non-negative real numbers alpha i and multiplied by the indicator function of measurable sets a i chosen from this product sigma algebra. So in, in that uh, situation, the proof is rather simple. You simply use linearity of the conditional expectation. Namely, that allows us to rewrite the conditional expectation of H given x1 and x2, uh, of x1 and x2 given G, as simply that linear combination of the, in, uh, of the conditional expectation of the indicator function of x, uh, AI of uh, x1 and x2 given G. So we have seen that that thing equals to the expectation of the indicator function of AI of x1 comma y, where y is chosen to uh, x2 of omega. And now I simply use the um, uh, linearity of the expectation to bring the alpha i and that finite sum inside that expectation. In that way, I obtain, uh, obtain the statement I would like to prove. The next step is to consider a general non-negative measurable function h. And remember, we assumed that h of x1, x2 is in L1. So we also know that that random variable when we plug in x1 and x2 is integrable. So since h is non-negative, I find a sequence of simple and non-negative functions which I denoted by hn, 
which converges in a monotone way towards H. Um, and in that, uh, moreover, we know that Hn of x1 and x2 is bounded from above by H, x1, x2, and that's an integrable random variable. So hence, we can use the dominated conversion theorem for condition expectations to conclude that the expectation of H of x1, x2 given G equals to the limit as n tends to infinity of the condition expectation of Hn of x1, comma x2 given G. But Hn is a simple function. And for simple function, we have proven in step three that this thing, this condition expectation here, equals to the expectation of h of x1 comma y where y is equal to x2 of omega and now we can simply use the monotone convergence theorem for usual expectations to bring again that limit inside this expectation and then in that way we obtain that h as uh, the ex uh, the final result namely the expectation of h of x1 comma y where y is equal to x2 of omega p almost two. So that was so to say the fourth step. Let's come to the final step. For general measurable function h we simply decompose it into its positive and its negative part. And we apply the step four then separately on h plus and h minus. So you see, I start with condition expectation and use the linearity of con the condition expectation sp to split that um, expectation over here into the condition expectation of H plus and the condition expectation of H minus. These are two um, non-negative random variables. So I apply the step four, which allows me to conclude that this condition expectation over here equals the expectation of h plus of x1 comma y where y is equal to x2 and the same holds true here then i use simply linearity and i finally obtain that that conditional expectation over here is equal to the expectation of h of x1 comma y where y is equal to x2 of omega p almost shown and this concludes the proof. So well what we have seen in that section over here is how we can define conditional expectation and what kind of properties they have. And um, you have seen that this conditional expectation behaves most likely as a usual expectation except for these um, effects that you have to be careful with uh, null sets. Yeah, we have argued in various uh, situations that we have find a countable union of null sets such that the statement holds true and the difference is this tower property and this measurable factors theorem. And having that at hand we can now come in the next um, lecture to one of the most important processes namely martingales. And martingales will be important later on in modeling financial markets.